Great pleasure to welcome Sam Petroda, a man who probably needs no introduction. He's been on the telecommunications scene for three decades. He's the founder and CEO of CSAM and a privilege to be the advisor to the Prime Minister of India. Sam, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. It is a unique opportunity because we are at the pan IIT conference. I want to start asking you about your role on the Knowledge Commission as the chairman. Knowledge Commission was set up four years ago by Prime Minister Banbon Singh to really look at knowledge institutions and infrastructures that India would need in the 21st century. In the last four years, we have looked at roughly 27 different subjects, submitted 300 recommendations with clear focus on five aspects of knowledge. Access to knowledge, which include languages, translations, literacy, libraries, uh, portals, networks, broadband connectivity. Then knowledge concepts, primary education, secondary education, distance learning, vocational education, higher education and variety of other things like teachers training, how do we get more of our kids into PhD programs, maths and sciences. And then we look at knowledge creation as to who creates knowledge, how knowledge is created, patents, copyright, trademarks, innovations, entrepreneurship. We also look at application of knowledge in agriculture, health, small and medium scale industries, and lots of our traditional knowledge that we need to digitize, document, organize, make it accessible. And finally, we look at the role of knowledge in improving governance with focus on e-governance at the federal level and at the state level. So all of these subjects sort of form a platform for knowledge. You must remember no one else has set up a knowledge commission in the world. There are education commissions, there are commissions on information technology, not on knowledge. So we looked at knowledge in a very broad sense. For perspective, uh, I want to take you back uh, to your role when the late Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi involved you and leveraged your resources and the, te the telecommunications revolution rather started. So let's shed some light on your role and you know where we came from. I started interacting with India in 1981. That was my first entry having spent in this country 15 years then. I decided to go back to India to look at telecom scene. Then we had 2 million telephones total. It used to take 15 years to get a telephone connection. Fortunately, I got to meet Mrs. Gandhi, then Rajiv Gandhi, and Rajiv Gandhi provided the political will required to launch many new initiatives in technology, in particular in IT. Without his political will, total support, confidence, trust, I don't think we would have been able to make a dent. With his support, we launched first CDOT, Center for Development of Telematics, in 1984 to build indigenous products, rural exchanges and all that, and then started privatizing telecom in a very systematic way. First with the manufacturing, then came sort of, you know, uh, separating BSNL, uh, MTNL basically, and the whole process started. Along with telecom, we then focused on IT, CDAC in Pune, for developing Param as parallel processing based supercomputer. We had variety of new organizations that we set up, including TIFAC, Technology Information and Assessment and Forecasting Council. So we really launched a lot of new initiatives. Um, then, so I went back for good from here, changed my nationality back to Indian, who worked in India uh, in the government. And then in 87, we launched a series of technology missions related to water, immunization, edible oil, telecom, literacy, dairy development. The idea was to use technology as an entry point to bring about generational changes. I want to come back to the policy uh, matter. It's very, very critical because I was speaking to uh, Tulsi Tanti yesterday and he was giving an example of how it is 
not easy to access even in the country like United States without the policy being favorable to entrepreneurship. But India has changed, uh, or, you know, left forward quite a bit in the last two decades. Do you think the emerging India is given an opportunity to leverage the right resources from the government and there's a will still with the government to open up because there's still quite a bit of hiccups? No, I don't think there are hiccups. I think the basic issue is that India has opened up substantially in all major markets. But remember, it is wrong to assume that private initiative will solve all India's problems. It's naive to assume that private initiative can solve all the problems, even in this country. But it is this vague idea of privatization that entrepreneur is the ultimate savior of the world. Wrong. Don't be under a wrong impression. Government interventions are very critical, everywhere. Government looks after, in democracy, larger public interest. So you can't say turn over government to private and everything will be sorted out. But let's not assume that if you privatize health sector, problem will be solved. Privatize water, problem will be solved. Privatize power, problem will be solved. Without right kind of government interventions, there cannot be prosperity for the masses. Absolutely. Point well taken, Sam. Government is the enabler, but without the energy and passion of the entrepreneurship, uh, you know, the yin and the yang has to be there at the same time. But there is also a sector called NGO. There is also a sector called local government. Okay. So don't ignore those two also. So it is really government, private initiative, NGOs, local government, all of this has to sort of jive together. All I can say is India is wide open. Lots of opportunities. You can do whatever you want to do. In whatever sector you want to make a contribution. <clears throat> but it is not about just making money. I think that's the point I'm trying to sort of indirectly emphasize. Of course, it is good to make money. Don't get me wrong. Okay. But I think romance in India is beyond making money. Yeah. Romance in India is to really transform the lives of the millions after millions with very little input in some cases. And that's the real challenge. Finally, I want to ask you, since you have laid so much emphasis on social entrepreneurship and social responsibility of a citizen throughout the world, if you were to stand here and call these individuals to come back and, and help grow the country, take it forward to the 21st century, what would be your call? Let's, say, let's take three points. I would say, first of all, recognize that there are all kinds of interesting opportunities in India at all levels. Business, academics, government, policy, NGOs, investment, no investment, time, talent. So that's the first call saying that a lot of exciting things are going on in India. Come join. Then find what you want to do. What meets your needs. And everyone has different, you know, expectations in life, different goals in life, and it's okay. Somebody might want to just make lots of money. Perfectly all right. Nothing wrong with it. Somebody might want to say, look, I've made that 10 million. I want to go do something in my father's village. That's also okay. So let's find what is the right thing for you to do. But don't look for things to do only in Delhi and only with the top level of the government and only with the best of the best because the real need is in district level at the grassroots level. <clears throat> so go to third tier, fourth tier cities and see what opportunities are and then things will multiply. So the bottom line is there are lots of things to do you got to decide what you want to do and how you want to do it, you know. Sam, it's a pleasure. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Appreciate the time. Thank you.